my name is Rachel Kramer Bussell. I'm the editor in chief of Residence 11, which you can find at residence11.com. We're a website and community that celebrates sensuality, romance, intimacy, and loving in a new age of human connection. In advance of our first live event, which is happening Saturday, February 11th, the Residence 11 Desire Summit on Sex and Relationships, we're uh, interviewing one of our speakers, Mashumi Ghosh. And before I get to the interview, I want to tell you the summit is taking place in Los Angeles. So if you're local, please join us in person. And if you're anywhere else or you're in LA but can't make it to the event, uh, you can watch the whole thing live streamed and you can find out more at summit.residence11.com. Mashumi Ghosh is an author, documentary filmmaker, and licensed therapist breaking down barriers in sexuality. Her techniques for evolved intimacy are now available through courses at Los Angeles Sex Therapy University, including her proprietary certification program, Pleasure Psych. She is a celebrated sex and relationship expert who has appeared in the media numerous times and is the founder of LAST, Los Angeles Sex Therapy, a collective of therapists, coaches, and educators whose clients access their services online worldwide. And you can find out more at mushumigosh.com. So we're going to be speaking about a variety of topics related to sex and therapy. Uh, and you can hear Mushumi speak along with Melissa Lassane at the Desire Summit on the topic of incorporating, incorporating kink in relationships. And stay tuned because I'm going to ask more about that. Make sure you hit subscribe wherever you're watching this so you don't miss out on any of our upcoming interviews. Okay, so before I get to your career now, I want to go back to your childhood growing up. Um, what did you learn about sex, whether at home, in school, pop culture, friends, and how have your views about sex evolved since those earliest things you learned? Sure. So I think, you know, growing up, it, sex wasn't talked about at all in my household, which I think is pretty common. It was very hush hush. Um, my parents are South Asian, they're immigrants from India, and they just are very traditional. Um, and so even though they actually themselves didn't have an arranged marriage, which is like pretty common in India, um, an arranged marriage is where the parents decide who they're going to marry. So my parents didn't actually have that, but still they didn't actually talk about sex or relationships um, that much much with us. However, I will say that I think my mother and my father both sort of treated me like a boy a little bit. Um, and they kind of never really even, they never talked to me about marriage. It was kind of almost assumed that I wouldn't get married or something like that. Like they had an intuition about me, I think from an early, early age. And then, um, in high school, I came out actually as, I was too scared to come out as lesbian. So I came out as bisexual at the age of 16. Um, and that actually, I think that label actually fits me a little bit better because I don't completely identify as lesbian, lesbian as it is, but I did come out at the age of 16, but I was lucky um, to be able to do so because I grew up in the Bay Area um, and in the I was a teenager in the 80s and um you know there was the aids crisis going on in the bay area and san francisco it was happening but even though that was happening i think there was like this sexual freedom kind of movement going on around me so i was able to have this like exploration um, and come out and have a group of friends and you know we just talked about sex all the time it was just like normal conversation. And I think as I got older and I realized the rest of the world wasn't like that, um, it kind of was like, I didn't understand it really. I was like, people are really conservative and that sort of, you know, you know, mimicked how my parents were. And I was like, this is definitely something that I feel like I can maybe help people with or that people need help with. So that's kind of, where my, how I got started and how I, you know, ventured into this work to begin with. I think it's been interesting because that's something I've been asking pretty much everyone. And, you know, I don't think most people 
grow up thinking, okay, I'm going to become a sex therapist. I mean, it's not a career option that at school, you know, they're like, you could be a doctor, you could be this. They're not saying you could do this. So I think people have to largely forge their own path. I mean, when they're older, they, and now especially there's people who've been doing it, but I think it is something where you have to be very driven to it, most likely for a, a personal reason. Um, so can you tell me about how you got into specifically what you know and um, why that, when you touched on it, but you know, as it's evolved, why that continues to be so important to you and yeah. you know, why, I guess also, um, I'm gonna ask some about the specifics, the common topics that come up, but is it more important now? I think sometimes people think, well, we're so evolved, like it's 2023, people, are sorted out with their sexual issues, but mm -hmm. why is it still so vital to people's lives to do the work that you do? Gosh, that's so interesting. Yeah, so I, it, similarly, Rachel, I did kind of fall into this work. Like I actually, um, I moved to Los Angeles to pursue a career in music, believe it or not. And I, um, or, you know, I was working in tech and then I worked in music and I was like struggling with finding, you know, like jobs that will pay. Like I moved down there because I was working in tech and I was getting paid a lot of money. And then when that thing fell apart and I got laid off, I was like, what am I going to do? And I already had a bachelor's degree in psychology. So I was like, I think I'm just going to get my master's. That way I'll always have like a stable job. I can work at a mental health agency. I won't have to sit behind a desk and do this like corporate work, which was definitely out of the question for me. So I actually chose psychology and to get my master's degree as a fallback um, for a music career that I wanted. And, um, and then as I was going through the program, two different people from two different friend groups were like, Mo, you should be a sex therapist. And I was like, and then another person said, Mo, you should be a sex therapist. I was talking to my boyfriend and I told him you were my sex therapist. And I was like, this is really fascinating because that had never crossed my mind ever in a million years had I ever even thought that I would do something like that. And ironically, I un in undergrad, I did a concentration in human sexuality in San Francisco. That was like one of the big programs on campus there. They have a huge human sexuality program. But this is like fast forward seven years and I had no idea that I was going to even do anything like that. So when people started saying that to me, I, it started like brewing and I was like, you know, maybe I will open a private practice in West Hollywood, which is, which was, you know, it's kind of a predominantly gay part of town. Maybe I'll open my private practice in West Hollywood and I'll start helping people with their coming out issues. So that's kind of how it all started. Um, and then slowly, you know, um, it just kind of evolved from there. Like a lot of, I was working with a lot of couples because that's really where, what I love doing is working with families and couples. And I was kind of trained in this theory that's called systems that um, looks at the systems that we're in. So relationships. Um, and I started working with a lot of people wanting to open up their relationship and then like kink and things like that. And all of that was stuff that I had already had a ton of experience with because um, you know, I, like I said, growing up in the Bay Area and then living in San Francisco in the nineties, I was exploring all of those things, you know, kink, open relationships. And so when, when these cup, when these clients started coming to my office, it just felt like a second nature to me to be talking to them about it. And so that's kind of how it just all grew from there. Um, and, you know, like you said, I never in a million years thought that that would be the kind of work that I did. And now um, you know, now that there are so many people that do this kind of work, um, and I find that there are so many, like if you're on TikTok and social media, there are so many like profound and pro prolific like sex educators out there. Um, sometimes I feel, I do feel like <laughs> my work is done a little bit. Um, but I do think that you're right. Like more than ever, even though there are so many people more and more getting into this line of work and so many people seeking out sex therapy or sex education or a sex coach or wanting more information about kink and all of the things. I think that more than ever, um, we live in a society that is polarized. And so we've got like more and more people that need it, even need more education around um, sexuality because we're falling into this place where 
like some really old, like antiquated belief systems seem to be coming into play. And um, so, you know, I always say this, it seems like we take two steps forward, but simultaneously two steps backward, we make, we make progress, but we're also not making progress. So um, I definitely think it's important that, um, and good that we have so many people interested in this work now. It's definitely way more of a like common job than it was when I um, was getting licensed and started. So, yeah. That makes sense. Um, so you mentioned kink and polyamory and coming out. Um, and I'm curious whether generally or more specific, what are the most common topics or issues that people come to you, and especially couples um, that you mentioned, come to you about um, needing help with? And is there, a, is there a general timeline of how long they work with you? Or I'm sure it depends on the situation. But if someone is thinking of working with a sex therapist, whether alone or with partner, a partner or partners, what can they expect from that process? Right. So I think you know, people, when they come to sex therapy, they want a quick fix. A lot of times, I think that's really common for people to expect something to kind of happen really fast. And I think that the reason I do like to work with couples and partners is because they tend to move things along faster. They tend to hold each other accountable. They tend to be able to um, with the help of someone, a third party, a therapist, be able to be a little bit more honest about what they want, what they need, and to see that progress faster. Um, not necessarily easy, but um, so I think that it can be fast. It can be fast. And when I say fast, I mean like you can see progress in like three to six sessions, depending on the commitment level of the partners, of course. Um, of course, a lot of times, you know, one partner is really committed to working and the other partner is not or is too busy or is suffering from other mental illness, depression, or has a lot of stress. So, um, you know, it really depends from partner to partner, individuals, um, how fast therapy can go. Um, but if you really want it to go fast, you can, like, it's really up to you. Um, and then of course, when it comes to opening up or when it comes to incorporating kink and things like that, they can activate, you know, old wounds. They can trigger um, past traumas essentially. And so when you're dealing with stuff like that, that, you know, that's going to create roadblocks and that's when therapy can take a little bit longer. And, you know, look, I have couples in my practice that I've been seeing for like, eight, nine years, and I won't see them for a year. I won't see them for two years even, and then they'll come back. Um, and sometimes when they come back, they're kind of dealing with the same stuff because the same stuff does tend to come up over and over. We just find new solutions for it. And sometimes then the solutions stop working. And, you know, like our experiences stay with us, you know, our old traumas, they do tend to stay with us. We just get better at managing them over time. So so I don't know. It's it varies. All of that to say, it varies how long therapy therapy takes. I like short term therapy. I'm a huge fan of solution focused short term therapy. I like to do coaching as well and just helping clients find what they need. Um, but I certainly have clients that have been with me for a long time as well. And for someone or or a couple or partners um, exploring working with a sex therapist what kinds of questions should they be asking, you know, on the initial call or consultation and what kinds of experience should they be looking for? And maybe can, this is related. Can you tell us a little bit about last and how it, how it works and how someone in LA or, or elsewhere would, would go about hiring someone? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the questions that clients should be asking their therapists um, when they come into therapy is, um, how does the therapist work? Um, for example, one of my therapists at last, which is Los Angeles sex therapy, it's a group practice that I started and um, I opened my pra solo practice in 2007, but I hired my first therapist in 2009. So last has been around for, you know, 15, 16 years, I guess. Um, and I hire um, sex therapists and we also have coaches as well. And one of my therapists, um, 
does a lot of self-disclosure in therapy and, and, you know, she's, she's, she's conscientious about how she does it, but that's something that she front loads to her potential clients, like in a, in a consult when they're doing a consult together. Um, so I think, you know, just asking like, um, what the therapist sort of like modality is, how the therapist works, is the therapist collaborative? Um, is there homework? That might be a question that you might wanna ask your therapist. Um, how long will it take? How long are the sessions? Um, I think a lot of people don't really necessarily know what sex therapy is. And so getting clarification around whether or not your practitioner is gonna do hands-on work, um, as a psychotherapist, I don't do hands-on work, but you know there are coaches and things like that that do. So, um, you know, figuring out what it is they need and what it is they're going to get out of therapy um, is usually the first conversation. But you know, I always let the clients know that we're going to talk about the issue. I'm very directive. I ask very direct questions, and I'm very direct. Like I'll ask questions about masturbation and orgasms and thing like things like that in the first in the first session. And so what I typically let my clients know is that we're going to talk about all manner of your relationship and we're going to kind of center um, sexuality and intimacy, at least initially, um, because, you know, that's why most, uh, most people come to Los Angeles sex therapy is because they don't have anywhere else that they can go to actually talk about sex. So we center that, that first and foremost when they come in. Thank you. Um, so you're also the author of the book, Love is Not a Pie, How to Love in Every Relationship. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about the book and what motivated you to write it and what people can get out of it. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, so the book is, um, it's really about being able to, I think, um, love authentically. And so one of the things that I noticed in when people are trying to open up or people are trying to explore um, new avenues in their relationship around intimacy um, is that they get tripped up around what others are going to think or what they're supposed to do and or um, this um, the like the jealousy and the insecurity um, and when we operate from a place like that, then we're more, we're less likely to, um, sort of usher in what's best for the relationship and best for us and best for our partners. Um, and so I, to me, I think the book is really about, um, how to be a good friend, how to be a good friend to the people that you're intimate with, because really at the end of the day, um, if we treated the people that we're intimately involved with, like our bestest friend in the world, we'd be like, here, go out into the world and have an amazing life. We want you to, you know, enjoy everything and eat all the fruits and have all the cake. And, um, and so many times we don't do that because we're coming from like an ego place a, a place where, um, we're afraid. Um, and so I think the book's really about that is how to, treat the ones that you love like a best friend. I don't know. That's how I would describe it, I guess. I like that um, concept. And I wondered, we, I've talked about jealousy with a couple of our other guests and how jealousy can prop up in open relationships. And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be in an open relationship, but it's a human emotion. So yeah. um, I guess whether or not people are in an open relationship, the answer may differ if they are or aren't. But can you talk about how people can approach dealing with jealousy um, and whether it's something they should be working through with a partner or partners, or should they be kind of dealing with it almost separately on their own since it's not necessarily like if they're jealous and the partner isn't jealous or isn't bothered by that, you know, is that something that you should work out with your own therapist or elsewhere, or should it, should it be a conversation between partners? That's such a great question. And I have, I have strong feelings about that because I've experienced it in my office. I've experienced it in my own life. When we let our partners know that um, something makes us jealous, I think the, I, the theor theoretically it's an ideal to be able to say, God, that makes me jealous. And I want you to be able to continue to do it because 
talking about our jealousy and talking about our problems, we live in a society where partners just automatically jump to fix the problem. And so a lot of what I work with with my clients is, look, if your partner's jealous, that's okay. Let's allow our partner to have all the feelings. You don't have to fix it unless the partner comes to you and is very clear, like, can we shift something around this? Because I don't know if I can handle this agony anymore. Um, so I, you know, sometimes what I, what I will recommend people do around jealousy, particularly around opening up and things like that is, um, first process it yourself. Um, what's coming up for you is this old stuff because a lot of our jealousy is old stuff. A lot of it's abandonment stuff. That's old stuff. Um, and, and to try to, you know, like track and see how much of it is your old stuff and how much of it is your partner maybe being disrespectful or maybe your partner's not um, doing what you asked, um, breaking agreements, like trying to track all of that before we um, bring it to the partner and have the conversation. Because we want to be clear when talking to our partners um, about and if we're not, that's okay too. We can say, I'm not exactly clear where my jealousy starts and your behavior ends, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but the more we know, the more we can be clear about our needs and what we need to make the situation a little bit better. I'm a true believer that in relationships, we can actually get what we want. It becomes um, about how we ask for it. And you know, people get upset that they have to ask for things. And that is an issue as well. That's almost like a whole other aside, but being able to talk about it, but first getting clear about it is key. I think that's really important. And um, this has come up in some of the other interviews where, you know, I think in our culture, we, we assume jealousy is only about sex or dating someone else or doing something explicitly sexual or along those lines. And um, when I interviewed Kevin Patterson, he was talking about being jealous of a partner going to see a movie that he wanted to see with the partner. And I don't think we really talk about that that much in our culture, that you can be jealous of something that is seemingly minor, but it might be important to you or, or, or like, like, I know I've been in situations where I've been jealous of something my partner did and they didn't consider it romantic or sexual or anything, but it, to me, it seemed that way. And it's like, it's not one of those situations where one person's right and one person's wrong. They, they could both be quote unquote right, you know? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and most of the time they are right. You know, we have to like, that's a huge part of therapy is um, letting each person have their experience, letting your partner, your, your partner's experience is real. You know, it's valid and it's real, even if you don't agree with it, even if you don't understand it. So, um, Moving on slightly to a topic we you've mentioned before, kink. Um, you're speaking at Desire Summit with fellow sex therapist Melissa Lassane on incorporating kink into your relationship. Um, can you talk a little bit about your approach to this topic and also what what does kink cover? Because that's such a, a broad term. Right, it's broad, and you know Melissa and I were just just talking about this um, and. Um, because I'm, I'm going to talk about my perspective on kink and it's, if this is an, like, if this is an introduction, introducing kink into your relationship, right? So it's more about, so kink is an umbrella and, you know, I think when people hear the word kink, they assume it's like whips and chains and, you know, get tied up and, um, you know, get blindfolded and all that. And to me, that's really not, that's part of it. That's a, an, an aspect of it. Um, but to me, kink is really anything that you have a proclivity towards that is not normative. So some, you know, normative is in our culture, um, for example, penis and vagina sex is normative. Um, so anything we kind of consider vanilla, um, anything outside that, like I grew up in a time when I came out in 19, in 1988, being bisexual was considered kinky. You know what I mean? Like that doesn't, that's not how people look at it today because it's a little bit more common and visible, but really anything that's not visible is your kink, right? Essentially. And anything that you don't feel comfortable sharing with the public 
is potentially a kink. So that's the approach that I take. And that's the approach I'm going to take when I do this talk. I am going to talk about BDSM um, because BDSM is a big part of kink. It's very kinky. And, and when we talk about the kink lifestyle, um, a lot of it is BDSM. And I'm going to demystify and define um, BDSM, what that is. Um, so, you know, BDSM, bondage, discipline, sadism, masochism. A lot of people think, again, it has to involve physical restraint, um, but it can also be psychological. In fact, like a lot of like prodoms, for example, work completely psychological and sometimes don't even touch their partners or their clients. So um, there can be power play, um, but, you know, a, a kink can also be a fetish. It can be a fantasy that you have. It can be, you know, a proclivity towards fishnet stockings and red high heels, um, a foot fetish, you know. So we're going to talk about all of those things. And, you know, Melissa and I are going to actually even share, like, um, when you hear the word kink, what comes up for you? Because when you're trying to incorporate it or introduce it to your relationship, to your partner, you might not even want to use that word because that word in and of itself might be weighted and heavy for a lot of people. That's really interesting. Now, I don't want to, I know you're going to delve more into this at the summit, but we did, we just touched on like when one person feels jealous and the other sort of doesn't feel like there's anything to be jealous over. Similarly, well, somewhat similarly, if one person in a relationship is interested in some aspect of kink and the other person or people are, are not or don't think they are, how can they go about even sort of discussing it or finding a common ground on how to proceed if, if, they, if it feels like they're at odds around the topic? Right. I mean, the short answer is go slow, right? I'm a huge fan of planting seeds. We're here, you know, like I was talking about in the book, we're here to support our partners. We're here to, to, to be together and to grow together and to have fun and experience pleasure and joy, right? Like that's the question I would obviously ask. And, and you want, you want your partner to experience joy. You may not be the person that gives them everything they need all of the time and that's okay, but let's hear each other out, right? Let's just, listen to what the other person has to say. The other thing is when you're talking to your partner about it, you don't have to divulge everything right away. You can just plant seeds. You know, I want to talk to you about something that I am, you know, that I have, you know, I'm curious about, or there's this sexy thing that I've always thought about. Would you be open to talking about it? It doesn't have to be today, but maybe next time we, you know, next time we go out and have a drink or something, we'll, we'll, we'll chat about it. What do you think about that? Like doing it in steps and planting little seeds along the way so that your partner has time to just stay on it or think about it. You know, hey, did you think about that thing I, I mentioned the other day? It's, it's pretty important to me. So I'd love to take some time and chat with you about it. Like letting your partner know something is important to you. And look, they might get defensive. They might be scared. They might be totally freaked out. So go gentle, take it slow. I mean, that's kind of the short of it is take your time with it. Don't pressure anything onto anybody because that's just going to make them run away. Right. That makes total sense. Um, so um, as we wrap up, I'm curious, what are you working on next and where can people find you? Great. Yeah. So um, I do uh, right now I have, I launched it in 2020. It's um, pleasure psych. And I mentioned it, you mentioned it at the beginning. It's, um, it's a basically a course where you get a certificate at the end. Um, so you can become a certified sex coach through this program. If you're a therapist and you want to develop a sex therapy niche, um, it's great for that as well. So I've been working on that. Um, and that's kind of the big thing. And then I have also been um, working on a couple of memoirs um, and I don't know if you know Gloria Brame. Um, she's a sex therapist also, and she has her own imprint. It's called Moon Groves Press, um, and they are publishing my first memoir, um, and we're hoping that it comes out this year in 2023, so that'll be fun. Very cool. Congratulations. I do know Gloria, but I did not know she had an imprint, so. Yeah. Uh, so everyone, please come here, Mashumi and Melissa Lassane on February 11th, or watch them live stream 
talking about incorporating kink into your relationship at Desire Summit. You can find out everything you need to know and get tickets at summit.residence11.com. Thank you so much, Mel. Thanks, Rachel. Bye.